Welcome to Dimensional Algebra. In the past, we explored the mysterious Maccabic numbers, then moved into the elegant golden number system, and later uncovered the geometric structure of quadrix numbers. Each of these offered a unique perspective on algebraic systems. But what about the ones we already know? Let's return to the foundations, the real numbers, and the complex numbers. What if both of these could actually emerge from something even simpler, an expression like a plus b times r, where r isn't a familiar constant, but a new fundamental element? This is the dyadic construction. Let's begin with the foundation of all mathematics, the whole numbers. These are the numbers we use for counting. Formally, we call this set n, and it contains 0, 1, 2, 3, and continues indefinitely. Whole numbers follow some important properties. First, they are closed under addition, for example, 2 plus 3 equals 5, and 5 is still a whole number. Second, they are closed under multiplication, multiplying 2 and 3 gives 6, which also belongs to the set. The whole numbers are limited in other ways. They lack additive inverses, for instance. There is no whole number you can add to 3 to get 0. The answer would be negative 3, which is not in the set. Similarly, they lack multiplicative inverses. There's no whole number you can multiply by 3 to get 1, because the answer is 1 third, and that's not a whole number either. Now, let's explore the dyadic construction. A dyadic number is defined by the expression a plus b times r, where both a and b are whole numbers. But here's the twist is an abstract formal symbol, and r raised to 1 is negative 1. That means, when we evaluate this expression, it becomes a minus b. Let's see how this plays out with a few examples. Take 5 plus 2 times r, that becomes 5 minus 2, which equals 3. Now try 0 plus 4 times r, that's 0 minus 4, giving negative 4. And for 3 plus 3 times r, the result is 3 minus 3, which is 0. These simple rules allow us to do arithmetic just like we would with normal numbers. Let's try addition. Adding 3 plus 2r and 1 plus 5r, we add the constants and the r terms separately giving 4 plus 7r. Evaluating that gives 4 minus 7, which equals negative 3. Now multiplication. Multiply 3 plus 2r with 1 plus 5r. We expand the expression, multiply every term, and simplify. We get 3 plus 15r plus 2r plus 10r squared. Since r squared equals 1, we simplify to 3 plus 17r plus 10, which gives 13 plus 17r. Finally, evaluating gives 13 minus 17, which equals negative 4. The dyadic system works, and it's already giving us both positive and negative numbers, using just whole numbers, and this strange new r. Let's take the next step in the dyadic system, finding multiplicative inverses. Given a dyadic number, written as a plus b times r, can we find another dyadic number, say, x plus y times r, such that their product equals 1? We multiply the two expressions and expand. We get a times x plus b times y, and a times y plus b times x, all multiplied by r. This must equal 1 plus 0 times r. That gives us a system of two equations. First, ax plus by equals 1, and second, ay plus bx equals 0. Solving this system, we start with the second equation. ay equals negative bx, which gives y equals negative bx over a. Substituting this into the first equation, we get ax minus b squared x over a equals 1. Simplifying, x equals a over a squared minus b squared. Plugging that back in, we find y equals negative b over a squared minus b squared. Therefore, the inverse of a plus br is a minus br over a squared minus b squared. Let's try it with a real example. Let f equal 3 plus r. Its inverse is 3 minus r over 9 minus 1, which simplifies to 3 minus r over 8. Evaluating with r equals negative 1, we get 3 minus negative 1, which is 4, over 8 giving 1 half. This is our first appearance of a rational number, showing how dyadic numbers can naturally lead to fractions, even though we began with only whole numbers. In the dyadic system, we can define a concept similar to complex conjugation. If we have a dyadic number f, defined as a plus b times r, then its conjugate is a minus b times r. This flips the sign of the r term, while keeping the rest unchanged. Now using this conjugate we define the norm of f as the product of f and its conjugates. That gives us a plus br times a minus br. Expanding this gives a squared minus abr plus abr minus b squared times r squared. The middle terms cancel out, leaving a squared minus b squared times r squared. Since r squared equals 1, we end up with a squared minus b squared. That is the norm of the dyadic number. For example, if f is 3 plus 2r, its conjugate is 3 minus 2r. 
the norm becomes 3 squared minus 2 squared, or 9 minus 4, which equals 5. But unlike complex numbers, where norms are always positive, dyadic norms can be negative. For instance, if f equals 2 plus 3r, its norm is 2 squared minus 3 squared, which is 4 minus 9 giving negative 5. Now that we've seen how multiplicative inverses in the dyadic system can introduce fractions, it makes sense to expand our framework. For instance, the inverse of 3 plus r gave us one half a number that clearly isn't a whole number. This leads us to a broader definition. A rational dyadic number is any expression of the form p plus q times r, where both p and q are positive rational numbers. Let's see an example. Can we represent one half as a rational dyadic number? Yes, one half equals 3 fourths plus 1 fourth times r. Let's verify that. Substituting r with negative 1, we get 3 fourths minus 1 fourth, which equals 2 fourths, or 1 half. It checks out. By introducing rational coefficients, we extend the dyadic system beyond integers, allowing it to express every rational number, and perhaps even more. Now we ask a deeper question. How can we compute square roots in the dyadic system? Suppose we're given a number f equals a plus b times r. Can we find another dyadic number g, written as x plus y times r, such that g squared equals f? Let's derive the formula. First, we expand g squared. That gives x squared plus 2xyr plus y squared r squared. Since r squared equals 1, this simplifies to x squared plus y squared plus 2xy times r. This must match a plus br, which leads us to two equations, x squared plus y squared equals a, and 2xy equals b. Solving the second equation gives y equals b over 2x. Substituting into the first equation, we get x squared plus b squared over 4x squared equals a. Multiplying both sides to clear the denominators, we reach a quartic equation in x. To simplify, let z equal x squared. We now have a quadratic in z 4z squared minus 4az plus b squared equals 0. Solving this using the quadratic formula gives z equals a plus or minus the square root of a squared minus b squared divided by 2. Taking the square root of z gives us x, and from that y is b over 2x. Putting everything together, the square root of f is x plus y r, where x equals the square root of a plus or minus root of a squared minus b squared, all divided by 2, and y equals b divided by 2x. This is our general formula for extracting square roots in the dyadic world. Let's now prove that the square root of 2 cannot be represented as a dyadic number. We begin by assuming the opposite. Suppose square root of 2 can be written as a rational dyadic number, in the form p plus q times r, where both p and q are positive rational numbers. Squaring both sides we get 2 equals p squared plus 2 pqr plus q squared r squared. Since r squared equals 1, we simplify this to 2 equals p squared plus 2q squared plus 2pqr. For this to be true, and since 1 and r are linearly independent over the rationals, the coefficients must separately match. That gives us a system of two equations, p squared plus 2q squared equals 2, and 2pq equals 0. The second equation tells us either p or q must be 0. Let's consider both cases. First, if p equals 0, then the first equation becomes 2q squared equals 2, which implies q equals plus or minus 1. But that leads to square root of 2 equals 0 plus 1 times root 2 which is circular, not a rational representation. Now consider q equals 0. Then the equation becomes p squared equals 2, so p equals root 2, but root 2 is irrational, contradicting our assumption that p was rational. In both cases, we arrive at a contradiction. Therefore, square root of 2 cannot be expressed in dyadic form. It is irrational. Up to this point, we've seen that square root of 2 cannot be expressed using only rational coefficients in the dyadic system. This limitation motivates a natural extension one, where the coefficients themselves can be real numbers. So we define a real dyadic number as an expression of the form alpha plus beta times r, where both alpha and beta are positive real numbers. With this broader definition, we can now represent numbers like square root of 2. For example, square root of 2 equals 1 plus root 2 plus 1 times r. Let's verify that. Replacing r with negative 1, we get 1 plus root 2 minus 1, which simplifies to root 2. It works. This confirms that by extending the dyadic system to real coefficients, we unlock the ability to represent irrational numbers, including the very ones that were impossible before. To handle numbers like the square root of negative 1, we extend the dyadic system by introducing the imaginary unit, i. This leads us to complex dyadic numbers. A complex dyadic number is defined as a plus b times r plus c times i, where a, b, and c are real numbers. In this system, r squared equals 1, 
i squared equals negative 1, and importantly, r and i commute, meaning their order doesn't matter. To evaluate such numbers, we follow the usual dyadic rule. Replace r with negative 1. So, a plus br plus ci becomes a minus b plus ci. For example, 3 plus 2r plus 5i evaluates to 1 plus 5i. Now what about the inverse of a complex dyadic number? Given f equals a plus br plus ci, the inverse of f turns out to be a minus b minus ci divided by the sum of a minus b squared plus c squared. Letting a equal a minus b, this simplifies to a minus ci over a squared plus c squared. Just like with complex numbers, this formula resembles the complex conjugate trick now adapted to dyadic structure. And with that, the dyadic world now reaches fully into the complex plane. In this final extension, we introduce a new structure called the quadrinion. It builds on a special set we call the unireals, a set containing all real numbers and pure imaginaries of the form k times i, where k is real. Interestingly, unireals are not closed under addition, for instance, 1 plus i is not a unireal, but they are closed under multiplication. A quadrinion is defined as a plus b times t, where both a and b are unireals, and t is a new unit satisfying t squared equals negative 1, like kr. t commutes with real numbers. With this, we reach a system that stretches beyond the complex plane while remaining algebraically rich. Now returning to real dyadics, remember that a dyadic of the form alpha plus beta times r, with positive real coefficients, evaluates to alpha minus beta. In the end, this is just a real number. The dyadic system not only supports arithmetic, but also comes equipped with a conjugate, a norm, and a clean formula for inverses. The conjugate of f is alpha minus beta r, the norm is alpha squared minus beta squared, and the inverse is the conjugate divided by the norm. All of this gives dyadics a full algebraic structure, as deep as it is elegant. If you enjoyed this journey through dimensional algebra, don't forget to like and subscribe for more. Thanks for watching.